Hi, thank you for coming. I, uh, I was with the CEO of a big box retailer. Uh, we spent eight hours together. And we were jamming on AI and Gen I and ML and LLM. And man, we had a lot of energy for this eight hour executive briefing. And we were getting ready to adjourn. And as I stood up, anxious to get to the steakhouse, he said to me, Chris, you haven't told me how I can send a survey to my most favored customers after they purchased, and I won't tell you what they purchased because I give it away, but it was, a, it was a product that had a high margin, but they didn't know why their customers were buying it. And so did, today, you'll learn how to send timely surveys when your best customers are using your service. And then, um, did you get a chance to, uh, to register for the Ferrari 488 in the back? At the end, we're going to have a drawing, and, and we're going to win that. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, the, uh, but we have the second best thing. We have Ferrari here, who's going to talk about building an ML-powered fan generation app. And I was talking to the Ferrari team before my presentation about how my daughter, well, she's not going to be an F1 racer. She has a lot of interest in racing. And on the Ferrari F1 app, if you have um, a daughter or a friend that's interested in racing, it's a really interesting video to check out. And so we'll be talking about that today. My name is Chris Sampson, and I head up Amazon Web Communication Services Group. And so the Communication Developer Services Group, we build go-to-market for the following products. There won't be a quiz after this. Pinpoint, multi-channel engagement service. Amazon SES, industrial strength email that helps you with things like deliverability and removing sp spam. SNS, Wicker, which is a service that encrypts your messaging. And Chime SDK, the ability to embed videos. If any of you use Slack, and you use the huddle feature that's powered by Chime SDK. We have lots of great customers. Our services are pretty quiet. Our brand isn't splashed anywhere. But if you receive a notification in the middle of the afternoon on a Friday for a Netflix video that might be coming out, that's coming through one of our services. If you're in Europe and you're fans of the Bundesliga League, and you're receiving notifications about your favorite players and how they're performing during their matches, that's using one of our services. The Washington Post uses our services to alert you to a subscription that might be close to expiring. And so many of our customers are using our services across the globe for things like OTP, one-time password. If you happen to be using a dating app, and you want to make sure that that person that's reaching out to you is not a robot, you might be using Pinpoint's SMS capability for one-time password. We send trillions of messages across the globe, and that's not to chess pound, but if you are building a highly scalable service that's going to send things like one-time passwords and multi-factor authentication and email across the globe to Japan and Europe and Russia and China and you name it. You have to have services that are highly secure, highly performant, and scalable. The customers that are using these services today, Amazon Prime is using these services for things like Amazon Prime Day, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, the same services. When I talk to customers, they don't say, hey, Chris, tell me more about Amazon Pinpoint or SNS. You can't keep all the services straight. Usually when I talk to customers in executive briefings in Seattle, they talk about building a communication hub. And that communication hub has four capabilities. The first is mass messaging, the ability to send a timely email, the ability to send an SMS as soon as somebody hits submit. You can use our services for nothing but SMS or email and not pay a dime for ML or for segmentation. 
And this is the beauty of taking a builder's mentality to building a modern architecture. You should be able to build improved customer engagement at your own pace. And as you as a builder, if you only want to improve SMS, you can do that using our services. But many of our customers are taking it to another level. They're starting out using SMS or email, and they're dynamically segmenting, segmenting their customers as they engage. It's not sat, static segmentation. That's when you sit around with your marketing team and you analyze data every month or so and create new cohorts. I'm talking about creating segments at that moment in time when it counts most. The best example I can give you is during the pandemic. When healthcare and life science companies had to quickly stand up testing services. Well, we were probably all in the same boat. We took that test and we waited anxiously. And we had hoped, obviously, that that test was negative. But when those tests turned out to be positive, there was usually a next step. That next step is dynamic segmentation. The ability to create, at that moment in time when it counts most, a cohort group with a set of follow-on steps. SMS or email are often just the entry points for dynamic segmentation. Another capability is just the ability to analyze downstream traffic. As you're engaging with those most favored customers, are they using an Android phone or an iPhone? You'll want to know that. And then last, one of the reasons why you might be here is you want to learn more about personalization. Hey, personalization is just a proxy for ML. That's it. But many of our customers talk about how Chris, when they come into these briefing centers, how in the world can I make sense of my email, my SMS, my push notifications, my CDPs? How does that all come together with this modern architecture? And by the way, and you can't tell me that I have to replace Salesforce and Adobe and all those services that I placed high value in. Many of our customers with good reasons have built a lot of capabilities with having email promotions, using SMS for OTP, and with good reason. These are systems that you built, and you can remember when email being used for promotion was kind of high tech. And it's with good reason that your marketing team is building segments. It's really important to understand your customer's behavior and how they fall in groups. And you'll have CDPs scattered throughout the enterprise using S3 maybe. Segment is a CDP provider. CRM system, a marketing automation system. It's really hard to keep track of all those data lakes in your services, but they were built with good reason. And then, of course, you might have the data science team working somewhere in isolation, building a predictive model to help with perhaps product placement for your customers that are engaging in commerce. All of these departments were built with good reason. But if you want to build a modern architecture, if you want to engage with your customers at that moment in time when it counts most, there's one thing that you should walk away from this presentation in. And that is, in order to build a modern architecture, you have to have these messaging systems using one data highway into your ML data model and one way out. Engage with your customers with the channels that they prefer. My parents prefer email. I prefer SMS. My son prefers push notifications. It's hard to navigate those channels if those channels aren't consolidated with one data highway in and one data highway out into your ML model. That's to me is one of the most important architectural principles you can have when building a modern engagement system of the future. And I'm gonna give you one example. <clears throat> in this example, and it's a fictitious example, I'm gonna wire transfer $100,000 from my brokerage account into a checking account, and I'm sitting in Tahiti drinking a Mai Tai. <clears throat> I execute with my app the wire transfer, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait. 
and now I'm starting to get anxious because that was to pay off the mortgage. And my wife is asking me, did you get it? Did you get it? <clears throat> I didn't. So now I call my brokerage and I have a choice. I can talk to the broker or I can leave a voicemail message. In this case, I'm gonna leave a voicemail. <clears throat> I leave a voicemail message. That voicemail message is transcribed using a service called Amazon Transcribe. It's an ML service. It's taken my voice and turned it into text. That text is then pushed to a service called Amazon Comprehend. Again, another ML service. Comprehend scores the text, and in this case, it is scored a 10. For Pinpoint, which sits in the center, 10 is just a cohort group. It's just a segment. But that 10 has meaning. The business rules that you've built for a 10 mean we're not going to send them an email or, or create a conversational bot and ask them what's going on. No, this is important. That 10, we are sending an event to a contact center where somebody with a headset is going to call Chris using a service, in this case, Connect. It could be another contact center. In that example, Pinpoint's just acting as the orchestrator, the conductor if you would, the middleware layer. And when I hear customers, I hear customers talk about this communication hub as a communication la middleware layer. Now let's go back to the example. Instead of a wire transfer, I'm interested in selling a stock. And in this case, I have to use the app to sell the stock. Some brokerages are saying, if you're going to trade in dollars and not buy and sell stock the symbol, and you want to just sell dollars, you're going to use the app. Well, in this case, I'm having trouble. I'm trying to buy an e I'm trying to sell an ETF. So instead, Transcribe listens again to my voicemail. It scores it in eight. After going through Comprehend, Pinpoint looks at the eight score and says, okay, for an eight, I'm going to instantiate another little bit of ML, a conversational bot, and I'm going to walk Chris through the execution, that stock sale. It could be, I'm just interested in buying a mutual fund. I'm just an old fuddy-duddy that's looking at a mutual fund, and really my brokerage isn't interested in me buying and selling mutual funds. But in this case, Pinpoint looks at the score, and in this case for the mutual fund, it's a three. Pinpoint reaches into the CRM system, reaches into S3, reaches into that CDP, pulls a link to the mutual fund and sends it over a good old fashioned email. Because good old Chris looks at email and doesn't use SMS or does not want a phone call. This to me is an example, this isn't an architecture, it's a architecture. This to me is an example of what the modern architecture looks like. You're using ML to engage with your customers based on the use case. Pinpoint is not just about sending messages. It's a middleware layer. It gives you optionality. It gives your enterprise optionality to use the channel that you want to engage with, on, with your customers. And it's not a ring fence solution. I often hear customers say, hey, Chris, I just want a UI and I want a ring fence my customer engagement solution. I need to make it easy. And unfortunately, the bad news is there really isn't an enterprise where you can create a really well-packaged customer engagement service. It really requires a builder's mentality that gives you the optionality to plug and play ML services like Personalize and Forecast and Transcribe. It allows you to use services like Salesforce, Adobe, S3, you name it. But by having a conductor in the middle of the orchestra will allow you to do that. I'm going to bring on stage my friends from Ferrari and Dynetta, and they'll talk to you about how they use ML to improve fan engagement, followed by Dynetta. Yep. Hi. So. Scuderia Ferrari Tifosi, raise your hand up. No one? 
No Scuderia Ferrari up, Tifosi? Uh, okay. Uh, not so much. Here, we have some from the fan of Scuderia Ferrari? No, not so much. <laughs> so, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in front of you all this afternoon to give you some tips on how in Ferrari we extended our global fan engagement. I work in Ferrari Digital and Data Department as backend and integrated system manager. And uh, in this session, with a bird eye view, I will start by describing the personalization need, how we implemented the use case, and uh, right after me with uh, Matteo, we will do an in deep architectural analysis of the solution that we use in production. So ready, steady, go. All right. First of all, a brief introduction of the official Scuderia Ferrari fan app that uh, Ferrari announced uh, last year during the AWS reInvent 2022. And now we can reach it out and uh, touch. Here we can see the Las Vegas Grand Prix qualifying recap. Impressive show there. Charles celebrating pole position and Carlos a little bit more serious for P2. That's a cool too, by the way. <laughs> However, as soon as the team uh, steps foot in the, the pub book, the official Scuderia Ferrari app will be feeding you with videos, images, and other content directly from the circuit before they hit social media. We'll also be meeting the wider team, both at the track and uh, in Maranello giving you a look of life behind the scene, adding an extra dimension to what is already known about the Scuderia Ferrari, gaining a fuller picture of the team's life in the paddock and in the factory. But now, let's move in with some example on how Scuderia Ferrari app improve the Tifosi engagement through Amazon Personalize that accelerated the digital transformation with machine learning, make it easy to integrate personalized recommendation. For sure, as we know on all our digital products that can be the mobile applications or um, web application, email marketing systems, and uh, so on, it's possible to easily gather data. So for example, through user preferences, here you can see Ferrari drivers, or Ferrari cars, or circuits, and so on. But also through interactions and content views. For this reason, data sets are crucial in machine learning as they provide the core on which algorithms are trained and evaluated. It's very important indeed to know inside out the data because they directly impact performance and effectiveness. In this case, but uh, also in other my experience on fields, was the same. Datasets and models must be fine-tuned for, for to optimize the final solution. Because of that, we carried out an optimization process with an iterative approach through five main steps. Number one, definition of baseline solution. The baseline solution is trained with the same items and the interaction data set present in production. Using the same configuration in terms of hyperparameter, where uh, the hyperparameter is a, a parameter whose value is used to control the learning process. 
Number two, data analysis. A preliminary investigation on production data sets have been performed by running Amazon personalized data analysis to get first inside and put some quick fix on data model, such, for example, uh, filter stale contents out of the data set, clean up records uh, with a missing value that can uh, negatively affect recommendation, or explode mixed values in, uh, into specific domain attribute with a lower cardinality. Later analysis steps highlighted a other more specific finding that we fine tuned on purpose. Third step, feature engineering. In the solution that we currently use in production, recommendations are generated almost exclusively on interactions. At this step, this was suffering from data sparsity and the high cardinality of metadata field used. Then we start to engineer additional variables that can be helpful when generated the recommendation. <coughs> For example, Amazon Personalize allow to perform a natural language, language processing on a single free text field. Then we arrive to the optimized solution training. The first thing to do for optimizing the model behind the personalization, sol personalization solution is to configure, in training model in, in, uh, is to configure the training run with a hyperparameter training job to find the optimal values. True sensitivity analysis on the local minima found by the job, and by testing different values of the popularity discount factor. It was possible to determine the combination of parameters that offered the best performance in terms of coverage and the recommendation relevance. Number five, evaluation. To assess the combination of parameters that offer best performance, a control solution was trained, which used the same filtered datasets as the optimized, of the, of the optimized one, but it does not apply feature engineering nor hyperparameter tuning in the process. Here you can see the iterative approach. And comparing an optimized solution version with the control one allow to define the impact of a feature engineering and the extent to which items metadata influence the recommendation rather than just iteration. The control solution has the same parameters as the solution in production. Hence, the popularity discount factor is set to zero. Eventually, Iterating over different solution metrics, it's possible to derive the next key finding. Seems pretty simple, hmm? In summary, data quality is the key, and data sets are the foundation of machine learning. The sides and the representativeness directly impact the performance and the effectiveness of related algorithms. Tuning hyperparameter allow for performance optimization and the popularity discount and filters allow to enforce business rules on the recommendations. Lastly, also in Amazon Pinpoint, we can connect to a certain type of machine learning model by using recommender model to predict which item a user will interact with and send those items to message recipients as personalized recommendation based on each recipient's 
attributes and behaviors. Grazie. And now, a warm welcome to Matteo for the architectural drill down. So, hi everybody. I'm really proud to be here in front of you today. Um, I'm Matteo Longhi, and I'm part of Ferrari Digital and Data Department as Cloud Architect. And so, without further ado, let's see some architectures. So, Scuderia Ferrari application is um, a high-level representation of the Scuderia Ferrari application architecture. You can see it in, on screen. And Scuderia Ferrari application is built on five core layers, which are the backend API layer, which leverages AWS AppSync to implement the backend for front-end pattern. This in order to decouple the front-end application from all the other layers and systems. Then we have the telemetry management layer, which leverages AWS Lambda, Amazon S3, and AWS API Gateway to store and share all the telemetry selected by our Ferrari communication team in order to share them to our fans through the Scuderia Ferrari application. Then there is the personalization layer which is based on Amazon Personalize that has already been described by Alessio. Then we have the video streaming layer, which is built on Amazon Interactive Video Service and AWS Elemental Media Convert. And it's used by our Ferrari communication team to broadcast unplanned session, unplanned live events during race weekends. So, uh, finally we have the analytics and push notification layer based on Amazon Pinpoint that we are going to see in detail right now. So let's deep dive on the notification layer architecture. The notification layer backend that you can see in picture is built on multiple AWS services. Among these, we can find Amazon S3, uh, sorry, Amazon Route 53, Amazon CloudFront, and AWS Certificate Manager, which together provide a custom domain to our AWS AppSync endpoint. AWS AppSync itself it's acting as primary GraphQL endpoints to expose GraphQL APIs to our front-end application. Then we have, for AWS AppSync, the HTTP and the AWS Lambda resolvers that enable AWS AppSync to connect to multiple data sources such as the Ferrari Content Management System and the Ferrari Digital Asset Manager. Then there is Amazon DynamoDB, which is used as storage for the notifications business logic. And finally, Amazon Pinpoint, to manage push notification to our fans. So, now let's focus on Amazon Pinpoint. On screen, you can see uh, an example use case where from right to left, Ferrari content creation team publishes a certain news into Ferrari CMS. In response to this event, Ferrari CMS publishes the content inside an SNS topic in the form of a new creation or an update. In response to that, Amazon SNS triggers AWS Lambda 
for AWS AppSync cache eviction and Amazon Pinpoint to engage our fans through a personalized push notification. So, let's get to the fun part. If you like, you can download the Scuderia Ferrari application right now by scanning the QR code you see on screen. Quite flashy, isn't it? Yeah? I give you time to scan it, so don't worry. I will pause. OK, so to wrap it up, to conclude, I want to thank you all for being here today. And, you know, we hope you will enjoy playing with Scuderia Ferrari application. Thank you. Okay, hi, my name is Alistair. I'm with Dynata who is a market research company, which I will go into a bit into. But first, I want to ask, any Dynata fans out there? I figured this much. Not even my own team. OK, thank you. OK, so that's the reason why I'm going to explain, actually, why email is so important to Dynata. OK, so why is email critical to us? OK, we're a market research company, and we are the world's biggest first-party data provider. What does that mean? That means that people actually tell us what they think about products, you know, about uh, some of our clients. You know, they might tell us also what they think about brands, people, etc. But they are the ones that tell us. We don't get that data through data mining or anything like that. They tell us. How do they tell us? Via surveys. If you've taken a survey, there's a very high chance that it's being Dynata powered. Now, we tell people, hey, there's a survey for you via email. They actually go onto some of the websites that we own. We have about 200 websites. They go, they subscribe, and they say, hey, I want to participate in surveys. I want to get something for it. They normally get points that they can cash out. And we tell them there are surveys for you that might match what you're looking for or might be interesting to you via email. And they look something like that. So where were we? Well, two years ago, we were not in Pinpoint. We were not happy. We had very little flexibility. The template that we showed our users, it was randomly chosen, was not personalized. We had very low visibility. Not all of the events that we had were tracked. Sometimes we didn't get all of the click events. It was, you know, iffy. It was very costly to maintain. As I said, we had 200 websites. Let that sink in. Right? Imagine that for your, you know, your content team. 200 templates that they had to maintain for 200 different journeys, campaigns, all of that. It was thousands of things that they had to do every time, update, et cetera. Do all of that manually. And we were also struggling with the stale data. Because it was a separate system, sometimes it took up to 24 hours for the data to sync over, and for us to be able to act on it. You know, that kind of closes a window in which you can actually tell your users something relevant. So we took a phased approach. Phase one, pinpoint adoption. So what was the objective there? OK, before we get fancy, before we start adding ML, let's simplify. Okay, Let's try to bury the content a little bit, and let's make sure that we can track performance. So for that, the first thing we were trying to do, OK, well, let's add some randomization in there, not just the template as a whole, but some pieces. And let's actually try to vary how well some of those perform. So here's what some of those might look like. And these are the pieces that we were randomizing first. So the template itself, you know what tells us, OK, yeah, this is the content that we're going to send, how we're going to try to engage them. I have some examples there. Some of them will say, act quick. Some of them might mention some brands. They might mention, hey, there's an extra reward for you, et cetera. That includes the subject that we say and the preview text, because as you can and tell there, they are like closely related. Then we would also try to randomize the popular brands, see if some people reacted better to some or others. 
then randomize the bundle software? Do they react better to getting more points over a longer period of time or less points over a shorter period of time? And then also trying to mention some popular rewards. You know, hey, Prime is coming up, you know, Prime Day. So, hey, perhaps the Amazon cards are going to do better. So this is what some of those emails look like, and I'm highlighting there what were the pieces that we were actually randomizing. But again, this is all random, right? There's no ML yet, nothing like that. Just try to get some variation. This is the base architecture for that. This is not the simplified version. This is it. Right? That's all you have to do. So for our architecture, because of what I told you, we have 200 brands, how we simplify that? Well, we use a custom channel exclusively. This is one of the channels that you can use with Pimpon. You don't have to stick with email that's built in or the SMS that's built in. You can use a custom channel. What does that do? That calls a Lambda. On that Lambda, you can do pretty much whatever you want. What were we doing? We were getting the sender configuration JSON for one of those brands, depending on what brand the user belonged to. That gave us the ability to manage all of these 200 sites on a single Pimpon project being able to do a single journey, a single campaign, so that we could reduce some of that maintenance that I mentioned about. Then also, the email address can appear in more than one brand. If you have used Pinpoint, you might know that the address has to be unique on the project. This actually allowed us to use a different field for the email so that we could have multiple endpoints within Pinpoint that had the same email address because they belong to one of those different brands that I mentioned. And then the only thing that the Lambda does after that, there might be some calculated replacements for some dynamics that we have, like the promotions that I mentioned. And then at the end, we just call the send messages operation. Now, Pinpoint has, you know, it's a pretty well-defined solution with Kinesis Data Stream, where we'll publish all of the events, the click events, opens, et cetera, so that you can get that easily into whatever system you want. That was phase one, so phase two. Phase two was all about handling the frustration of the users. If you don't have frustrated users, you probably haven't experimented enough. Okay, we do have very frustrated users sometimes. So what was the objective here? It was to increase the productivity of our users. As I said, they're taking surveys. Let's try to get them to take more surveys. Let's try to get them to make more money and improve their attention. Let's keep them around longer. You know, taking service is not a very glamorous activity. I'm going to have to say that. Sorry, guys. But in the end, it makes you money, right? So we're going to try to keep you around. We're going to try to keep you engaged. We're going to try to mention topics that are of interest to you. So what was the strategy for this? OK, offer a service where they have a high likelihood of completion. There's nothing worse for our users that go through 40 minutes of answering questions and being told, eh, well, we don't actually want your opinion. We want somebody else's. So we want to reduce that. Okay. And what was the measurements for this phase two? Okay. How many survey completions do we have during those first 30 days? And how many people are sticking around? So that's the strategy for that's what the strategy looked like for that. That's what you would see on one of our websites after you click one of those email invites. We would show you a list of surveys. So let's try to do some variation there. Let's try to show you the things that you are more likely to be interested on and you are more likely to complete. So those five, four, sorry, four tiles that you see there is what we were trying to optimize. So this is actually an ML solution that I'll go into in a bit. But before that, I want to show you the data lake diagram, which is also pretty simple. We have multiple event sources. Some of them are going to be the users on the actual website. Some of them are going to be our own services that might be running some background jobs, et cetera. But all of those go into a Kinesis data stream. That Kinesis data stream then gets through Firehose into an S3 bucket in Parquet files, because you know that's kind of the norm right now. And through S3 replication, they make it over into a centralized AWS account. So the left side that I'm showing there, that's actually replicated across multiple AWS accounts that we have, because we have different domains and subdomains, and sometimes we you know, for ease of use in AWS, we like to separate those accounts. But in the end, that simple template there is what we replicate into each one of those so that we can get everything into a single data lake. Now, for this solution, we were actually using SageMaker. 
So here's some of the attribute examples that we were using as part of this model. That's actually not all of it, it's a lot more than that. But the nice thing about SageMaker is that it takes, it kind of makes it too easy, you know, it takes the data science out of it because you don't have to do your own correlation analysis or anything like that, it's all done. Right, it, it'll highlight it for you, it'll try to tell you, this is, these are good features, these are not, et cetera. But once we do that, we were using the data lake to train that, and then what happens when a member clicks on the email is they get to that page that I showed you, and we call the real-time inference endpoint for the model so that we can say, okay, these are the surveys. Now, phase three, which is probably what you're here for. This is about optimizing the content, what they see on the emails. Now, I'm actually highlighting there that there's two sort of separate but related objectives in there. Increasing open and increasing click rates. It's not the same thing. Right. Now, the strategy for that was we would have ML models with different variables. And notice that I said models. It's not a single model. Don't be afraid to split your problem into smaller problems as you try to approach this. And the measurements for this were obviously, okay, yeah. Did the open and click rates increase with the ML model versus without? And for this, we decided to use Amazon Personalize. So how we approach this? Multiple data set groups and recipes. So I showed you first the content that we were randomizing. That's repeated here. Now I try to basically put it within one of those recipes. So for user personalization recipe, we, we optimize the template, again, the subject, the intro. Now for the trending now recipe, that was perfect for the popular rewards. You know, get real-time data in, try to suggest which are the popular rewards right now, what is gonna get people interested. And then the personalized ranking for which might be brands of interest for this person, which might be promotions that are interesting for this person, right? So it's three different recipes here. You don't have to use just one for your content. And again, I'm just showing there, okay, just to reference the content that I was talking about. This integration diagram is actually almost the same that you saw for phase one, with the exception of the bottom part, right? So you'll see there we had the Kinesis data stream already. This is actually feeding into a lambda that is the one that transforms and categorizes the events that it's getting so that it can send them to the right uh, personalized event trackers. The personalized event trackers are the ones that feed the real-time data into your personalized solutions. When you get that, you can be a lot more accurate with the messages that you're sending people because it's coming from real-time data. Okay? Now, you can also train personalized based on historical data. That's what we had the data lake for. And the only change that we had to do in the Lambda for us to achieve this was have the Amazon personalized call. Right? That's it. It was the same Lambda for the custom solution, just one more call. Now, further improvements that we had for this was reducing the cost. Obviously, that could be one other thing that we can optimize. People might be very well more inclined to take the ones with the longer reward. So what if we try to optimize also for cost? Should we try to personalize the time and frequency in which we send the emails? Right now, it, that's not personalized, really, but it could be. We could also filter some of the brands that we suggest based on whether they're going to be available or not. What I mean by that is, well, you know, these are normally gift cards. Perhaps they're not going to be available. So it could be something useful. And now that I've explained this, I actually want to share some of the lessons that we learned while we were going through this. So number one, ensure visibility. If you cannot track that your changes are having a positive effect, you don't want to start making changes yet. Right? We've had that happen a couple of times where we thought we had the visibility that we needed, but we didn't. Make sure that you have your KPIs, your key performance indicators, well-defined. Now, collect unoptimized data early. This might sound counterintuitive, but uh, if you saw what we did, we actually tried to collect how the randomized data was performing so that we could then use that to train the models. This is actually what helps you do that. And define the problem. Okay, make sure that you define the problem properly. So what if we had decided to only try to optimize click rates? Well, a model might be inclined to tell us, 
hey, send to that one guy, the one guy that's almost 100% sure that he's going to open your email. Hey, 100% click rate. Awesome, right? Well, you only send one email. Right? You don't want to do that. And again, don't be afraid to split the problem. It might look like content is one single problem, but it might not necessarily be. Okay, get creative. Now, on the don'ts, don't use ML for every problem. Not everything is an ML problem. One of the first things that we try to do is, is there a good time to send to our users? Are they going to be more likely to open that one time or another? Let's try to analyze that data. Let's try to see if we can personalize that. Oh, but we were not even using time zones. Eee. And guess what? When we started using time zones, click rates went up. Oh, OK, sorry. We should have done that first. Don't break your promises also. If you're personalizing the content, make sure that when they click on that email and they land on your website, they see what you told them you had for them. Right? We're a survey company. We're telling them to take surveys. If, they, if we tell them, hey, there's going to be a survey about F1 race cars. Yay. And they click on it. It's a survey about puppies. Uh, well, they're interesting, but they're not what I was looking for. Okay? So make sure that you don't break your promises when you're trying to do ML optimization. And that's it. Thank you for your time.